Chúng ta hoàn toàn có thể tranh thủ lúc đi service, giờ nghỉ giữa các tiết học, lúc chuẩn bị đi ngủ, mỗi khi rảnh rỗi cuối tuần để luyện nghe tiếng Anh. Điều này sẽ khiến não bộ quen dần với việc học tiếng Anh, giúp bạn luyện nghe tiếng Anh một cách rất tự nhiên và đơn giản. Nào cũng đến với bài số 28 chuỗi series Listening Test ngay thôi. Part 1. You'll hear a woman talking on the radio about sport aid. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, you're listening to Redgate Radio and I'm Alex Dunbar. As you may know, people in the city will be taking part in Sport Aid this weekend. Here's Liz to tell us more about this event and how you can get involved. Thanks, Alex. Well, this is the fourth year of Sport Aid, and it looks like it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Sport Aid is organised by the City Council, and it supports a number of different charities, although the main reason for its existence is to raise money to help developing countries. Last year, it raised over £100,000, and that money has helped to make life a little easier for people in many parts of the world. Just to give you one example, the village of Otunga in Chad now has a water supply, meaning that the people no longer have to walk miles every day just to get water. And there are countless stories like that. By contributing to the infrastructure of different regions, it's hoped that things like sport aid will enable many more people to climb out of poverty. Another way in which that happens is by giving people the knowledge and skills to earn money. One of the biggest issues facing people in many poorer areas of the world is education. Something that we take so much for granted can be rare and expensive in some regions. Education is seen as key to development and money from sport aid has paid for schoolrooms and equipment in a number of places. So what can you do to help? There are lots of ways in which you can get involved. First of all, you can go down to the biggest attraction of the day, the Sport Aid Charity Football Match. There will be thousands of people at City Stadium and all the money raised from the sale of tickets goes to charity. There's much more going on than just a football match, of course. There will also be lots of entertainment for the whole family, including a fair, stalls selling all kinds of food and even a chance to try out some sports you may not have tried before, like softball and volleyball. It's probably going to be a very active day, so it's best to make sure that everyone is in comfortable clothes before you go down there. It's always a fantastic day out, and it's a great way to show your support. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. But you're not restricted to being a spectator. Apart from the main event, there are a large number of smaller events taking place across the city. These range from fun runs around the park to games of cricket, and there's sure to be something happening in your area. Contact details are available for the people putting together each event, and you can get those from the council website. We'll be giving you the address for that at the end of the program. It's still not too late to organise your own event, as lots of people around the city are, although you'll have to get going on it now. First of all, do check that there isn't a similar event in your area, and then call the town hall to register your event. The local council needs to approve all events, and you'll stand more chance if you can come up with a sport that's new to some people, rather than just another game of football. Use your imagination, or try the internet to get some ideas. Try to come up with something that's going to get lots of people along, and which will raise money. You might not want to go for anything that turns out to be too costly though, since the council isn't able to supply bats or balls or anything else you need. 
but they will give you advice on finding a good location and might even be able to help you out with small prizes for winners, as well as making sure that everyone knows about your event by publicising it on the website and sending you an organisers pack with lots more information. There are a couple more things you need to be aware of for your event. There aren't any age restrictions. Although, if you're under 18, you'll need to get an adult, such as a parent, to sign the forms for you and to handle any money raised. But you do need to live in the Red Gate area. You should also be prepared for anyone to turn up, since all events are public. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a local radio program about cycling courses in London. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. There's been a great deal of interest lately in encouraging people to use bicycles instead of cars as a means of transport. But not everyone is confident about riding a bike at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a city like London. Jack Hayes is a professional trainer who works for a London-based company, City Cyclist which provides cycle training for the public. What exactly do city cyclists do, Jack? Well, our basic purpose is to promote cycling as a sustainable form of transport. We believe the best way to promote cycling is to teach people to use their bikes safely and with confidence. In European countries, people all learn from their parents, and they also learned in school. And when I tell them I teach people to ride bikes, they laugh. They think it's crazy. But here in London, it's completely different. You're approaching the point where a whole generation of people have grown up not being allowed by their parents to cycle because it was considered to be getting too dangerous. And so, in turn, they can't teach their children. We believe in realistic training. So, if someone wants to use a bike regularly, say to get to work or school, we aim to train them by teaching them to ride on the actual roads they'll use so they can develop the basic skills they need and build up their confidence that way. At City Cyclist, we believe cycling's for everyone, no matter what age or level of ability or mobility. We do complete beginners and also advanced courses. That's for urban cyclists who want to deal with things like riding in streets with complicated intersections and things like that. We don't promote the use of personal protective equipment for cyclists, and we endorse the policy of the European Cyclists' Federation that parents should be allowed to make an informed choice as to whether or not their child wears a helmet. We believe the key to safe cycling is assertiveness, taking your place on the road. This has to be instilled right from the beginning. Assertive road positioning and behaviour is the key to safe cycling in congested urban environments. Some people are surprised that we don't promote the segregation of cyclists from motorised traffic, but we don't think that's practical in all urban environments. Instead, we teach people to use as much road space as they need to travel safely and effectively. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, as well as courses for individuals, City Cyclist provides a number of services for organizations. For example, we can deliver fun, safe cycle training activities at schools, arranging courses so that the disruption of curriculum time is kept to a minimum. As well as this, in order to promote safe cycling, we have provided training courses for employees and staff of local councils. And we are also increasingly looking at developing training courses in companies in order to help employers work towards green transport plans by helping to increase the number of staff cycling to work. Right, so that's a brief summary of what we do. If any listeners would like to find out more about the organisation, you can have a look at our website. That's City Cyclist. C I T I Cyclist. Co. Uk. And in order to book lessons, you can either phone us on 020 7562 4028 or do it online. There's an application form on our website and you can just download that and send it in. We charge £27.50 per hour for one-to-one -one lessons, plus £6 for each extra person. So you're looking at just £39.50 for a family of three, say. If you've never been on a bike in your life before, we reckon we can get you riding in one hour, and for most people a course of road training usually takes three hours. But whether you're a parent or a child, an individual or an institution, We'll be happy to discuss your special needs and make a program just for you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. We'll hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec, is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course, such as Greek, Italian and so on, but 
Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So, are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. Okay. Well, how are we going to organize this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table, and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago, and a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year, in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea! I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump. Round and all those names. So, how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak: for grilling, for marinating, and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef, for stir fries, I suppose, and premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast, and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a forty percent increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars. And those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours, and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about languages. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, in the first lecture on anthropology, we're going to look at languages and how they are disappearing fast and what effect that's having on people and the world as a whole. We hear so much in the news about the possible extinction of animal and plant species in the world. It's a sad thing that one day certain animals will cease to exist. But how many of you are aware that the world's languages are facing a similar threat? Believe it or not, there are currently more than 6,000 languages spoken in the world today, but experts believe that by the end of this century, this number will be reduced to half. And as each language dies, the culture and specialised knowledge of a community dies with it. The unique knowledge of the environment, local wildlife, plants, animals and ecosystems, not to mention the cultural traditions of the people themselves, will become lost forever. In essence, each language is not just spoken or written words strung together. Language has the power to hold the entire history of a people. Approximately one language dies every two weeks. This is an unprecedented situation. Never before in history has there been this rate of rapid decline. Most human languages are spoken by relatively very few people. Let's put this into perspective. The Ethnologue, the leading authority on the world's languages, has put together a list of every living language known to man. There are over 6,500, of which 6,000 have available population figures. Now, 109 million people speak just 10 of these languages, and they are the major languages of the world. At the opposite end of the scale, there are minority languages which are only spoken by a few people, and that's what this chart is illustrating. The number of languages is represented on the vertical axis, and the total number of languages that make up this group is an astounding 1,619. For each of these smaller language groups, the population range of speakers goes from 1 to 999. Even more incredible is the fact that out of these small languages, over 200 of them have a speaker population ranging from just 1 to 9. Imagine only 9 people speaking your language in the whole world, or even only 1 or 2 people. Now, let's think geographically. In total, there are 516 languages that are nearly extinct, where only a few members of the older generation survive. When they die, the language will die with them, lost forever. The majority of nearly extinct languages come from the Pacific and the Americas, making up 74%, followed by Asia at 15%. Europe has the smallest percentage of languages that are nearly extinct, only 2%. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 37 to 40. Entire languages which have survived for centuries are disappearing as we speak. But why is this happening now? There are several reasons for a language's demise. Globalisation has made the world smaller and technology has made it easier for people separated by vast distances to communicate in a common language which further ensures the growth in economic status for such communities. 
Minority languages have given way to the main languages of global communication, like English. On a social level, speakers may feel the minority language to be old-fashioned and behind the times. Maybe even speakers are slightly embarrassed to speak the language of their forefathers, identifying more with an international language that brings with it improved economic status. Now, some do argue that a reduction in the number of world languages is inevitable, and anything to ease communication between nations is a good thing. And granted, there is a point to be made there. But what are the long-term implications of this? Consider this: language, in both spoken and written form, is the vehicle for oral traditions to be passed down through generations. When a language becomes extinct, this link is broken, and these oral traditions are lost. This has enormous implications for the identity of a community. We can't stop the changes that are happening in the world, but we can try to keep languages alive through language maintenance programs and by documenting languages before they disappear, so they can be studied and maybe even resurrected in the future. It's also important to remember that many people who speak threatened languages can neither read nor write. Helping them become literate goes a long way towards protecting the language. Preserving a language is not easy, but there have been exceptional cases where languages have been brought back to life. In Ireland, Irish Gaelic, once a dying language, through national determination, is now spoken by 13% of the country's population. We'll go into what happened there in more detail in my second lecture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet. Trong bài listening test ngày hôm nay, các em có bất kỳ câu hỏi thắc mắc nào? trong video ngày hôm nay các em có bất kỳ câu hỏi thắc mắc cần giải đáp nào không à, trong video ngày hôm nay các em có bất kỳ câu hỏi thắc mắc nào cần được giải đáp hay không đừng quên comment ý kiến cho thầy biết ngay nhé xin chào và hẹn gặp lại những video ngày hôm sau có cần giải đáp không vòng hai chín ba mươi